Okay, I got the, the go ahead for Mariah. So that means we can, we can get started. So welcome everyone. I'm really excited to have all of you here today for this webinar. So we're going to be talking about communicating across generations, managing the generational conflict in the workplace. Uh, so today you will be hearing from me. I am Michelle Fernandez Galinondo, and um, as well as Alex Rowan, who is our training specialist at ACU and the Star Center. And we're both on camera. All right, my computer, there we go. <laughs> so we're just gonna start off with a few um, housekeeping items. Again, I'm sure everyone knows most of this. We've all been virtual for long enough, but the session is being recorded and the recording is gonna be sent to all of the registrants as well as the PowerPoint presentation. So I know people usually have questions about that. So you will be able to get all of this. Um, you know, if you wanna be on camera, that is always wonderful, but definitely don't feel like you have to, but please be present um, and engage. Use the chat box. So feel free as we're presenting to put in any questions in the chat box. Um, I believe you may also have the ability to unmute yourself. We do have a pretty big um, uh, number of attendees. So if you are not talking, if you could please just make sure to mute yourself. If you are having technical difficulties, Mariah Blake would be your go-to so she can help you out. And at the end, if you could complete our evaluation, um, that's just really important for us to know, you know, what we're doing right, what we can do better and bring you these type of trainings that um, you're looking forward to. Okay, so if you've been to any of our trainings, you also have heard about ACU and the STAR Center. But for those of you who have not, I just wanna give you a quick overview. So as it says here, you know, our focus is that access to care and clinical support. We really look at how to supporting a transdisciplinary team. We were funded by National Health Service Corps alumni, so it's still very much at the core of what we do. Um, but we have many different programs from vision services to our JEDI programming, um, our suicide safer care. And then today, the program that we're specifically here with is the STAR Center. So um, we got our national cooperative agreement in 2014, which is funded by the Bureau of Primary Healthcare. We are one of the 21 NTAPs. So those are the national training and technical assistance partners. And the, what I really always like to point out from these slides is our resources, our training, our technical assistance. It is free. Um, you can go to this website. So that website is specifically for the STAR Center, has all of the resources available there. And you can also contact us at this email. Um, and just so you know, that email goes directly to me and then I filter it to um, the different team members depending on where it is appropriate. So this is the really awesome, amazing Star Center team. So that is all of us. You have all of our contact information on this slide. So feel free to reach out um, at any point for any questions or anything you may need with your workforce um, issues and recruitment and retention. And then as I mentioned, these are your two presenters. So um, I will be starting off the presentation. We'll go through some Mentimeter slides. I'm gonna kind of build that foundation of the different generations. And then really the, the bulk of the presentation is gonna be with Alex, who's gonna do um, a lot of interesting conversation around conflict management and communication. So as I mentioned, we're gonna get started with Mentimeter. If you have never used Mentimeter before, um, it just it's a great way to kind of do an icebreaker, get to know who is in the room today. So as you see on this slide, there's menti.com. That is the code that you will need to put in in order to access these slides to be able to answer the questions that we have coming up. You can also use the QR code. So just put your phone right up to your screen to go ahead and um, have the slides come up. And then what Alex is gonna do, he will be putting into the chat a link that will take you directly to the Menti slides. So I'm just going to give everyone a really quick moment in case they need the code. Um, oh, okay. It's all in the chat. So perfect. Thank you, Alex. So let's go over to the Mentimeter and you're going to see a quick transition in screens if it lets me. There we go. Okay. So it seems like right now we have mainly millennials. I am a millennial as well. Um, oh, there we go. So Gen X, one baby boomer. 
And I'm just going to give it a few more seconds um, for everybody to be able to respond. And Gen Z, welcome. That's always exciting. Okay, so mainly we do have Gen X and Millennials, but also Baby Boomers and Gen Z are represented. So welcome everyone. Um, you know, again, we're going to be talking about all these different generations and how to communicate with each other. So the next question um, you will see on here is we would love for you to share a little bit more about yourself, really whatever you're comfortable with. So organization role, time in that role. <laughs> so Alex wrote favorite, wa favorite waffle topping. Um, I don't like any toppings at all on my waffles. So that's my answer to that. If you can access Menti for some reason, you can also put it on the chat, but just tell us a little bit more about yourself. Um, again, we just would really love to know who is in the room today. And these answers, by the way, as well, they are anonymous. So, um, you know, feel free. Oh no, that the chat is disabled. Um, let me, Mariah will be, will be able to assist with that. Um, so I apologize that that was occurring. So hopefully we can get it working. If anybody else is also having that issue, just go ahead and let us know. Um, and we'll make sure to, to work on that. And again, I believe you can also unmute yourself if you have a question. So, okay, awesome. We have, it seems like a bunch of different people. So we have mid-level managers, peanut butter, orange marmalade, very delicious, public health nu uh, nutritionist, butter in every square <laughs> and maple syrup. That is like, that takes a lot of time, but I love that. Um, communication associate, um, grant writer and supervisor at a health center, director of clinical programs, recruiter, um, director of HR, and I see the syrup and whipped cream. Um, I see the director of equity and training at CCLAC. Hello, I know I've worked a lot with you guys, so always great to see you here. Um, Gardner Health Services, their safety coordinator. Nutella is delicious, so totally understand that. Oh my God, there's so many. <laughs> By state champs, uh, we have Cherry Health, Island Community uh, Medical. So a lot of people, really um, a broad category from HR to communications to Jedi work um, and also um, clinical. So I see there is um, a pediatrician online as well and then all your waffle toppings. So everything sounds very delicious. All right, so let's go on to our next slide. So we're just gonna have a, a few more slides and then um, I will go back into the presentation. So here we're asking, you know, do you believe or do you think that conflict is a generational trait? Um, and really keep that in mind as we go through the presentation uh, because this is a lot of what we'll be talking about. Oh, and Mariah just sent to everyone that the chat should now be enabled. Um, you can also raise your hand um, and we can, you know, we can answer your questions that way or let her know to be unmuted. So if anybody continues to have any other issues, please feel free to let me know at any time. Okay, so somewhat absolutely not really. Okay, I see all the, the absolutely and the not really going back and forth, but it seems like somewhat um, is the, the main response that we have. And we do have a few individuals who said not at all. Okay, and we're still responding. Yeah, so absolutely and not really are pretty close together. And then I believe this is our, our last one or there might be one more. But very similar, is conflict an age-related trait? Um, again, as I said, this is very much what um, a lot of what we'll be talking about. So somewhat, not at all, not really. It moves very quickly, <laughs> so it all changes. Okay, I'm just gonna give it a few more seconds. 
All right, so it's interesting. So for this one, most people said not really. And then I'm going to check the chat because I see there's something on there. Oh, yes. And Mariah put her email. So for some reason, you can't see the chat. Her email is mblake. So that's B-L-A-K-E at clinicians.org. And she can assist you. All right. So most people said not really. And then this, yeah, this should be the, the last question. Is good or bad communication a generational trait? So you know, really how do you, how you communicate? Um, does it depend on your generation? And are some better, some worse? Okay. So this one's very similar. We have most people answering somewhat. So that's wonderful. So again, just keep this in mind as we go through today's presentation, because this is a lot of what we're gonna address. So let me go back into the presentation to just give me a quick tech moment. So these are all the questions that we just went through. All right, so as I said, I'm gonna really kind of um, lay that foundation for what we're gonna be talking about. And when we're looking at generations in the workforce, one thing that is really important is to know there are five generations right now, for the most part, that are currently in the workforce. So when we think about traditionalists, we um, usually think of people who have retired. And yes, many individuals in that age category have retired, but there are many that are still in the workforce. And they bring the experience that they've had throughout many, many years, very similar to baby boomers. But as we're seeing with Gen X millennials, you know, I think oftentimes we think of these generations as being much younger than they really are. And these are individuals who have also been in the workforce, some over a decade. So it's important to just keep in mind that as we have so many different people, then we have that diversity, that difference. And sometimes that's what can create that conflict and the difficulty across communication. And then of course we have Gen Z joining the workforce. So those would be the individuals who are 25 years old or, or younger. And you'll see when Alex does his presentation, he's really going to make a case that it's really a lot less about the differences and kind of the, um, uh, you know, the generations being against each other, but really being more of how do you build positive communication. And one thing as we go through the presentation that's also important to think about. So in the same way that we talk about diversity, any type of diversity, so, you know, ethnicities, race, gender, sexual orientation, disability status, doesn't matter what it is, different generations, different ages, that is also part of that diversity that you're bringing in to the organization where you work. And there is a difference because unfortunately, and sometimes when it comes to generations, we're much quicker to say, okay, Stereotyping is fine. I know um, a while back I did a presentation on um, the uh, generational communication and differences. And when I stood up to speak, there was somebody in the front row and I think they were kind of joking, but also their first comment and they yelled it out was, I hate millennials. So, you know, those type of things I think were sometimes much quicker to be okay with that stereotyping. But as it says here, you know, stereotypes really are harmful. But the differences, when we acknowledge differences, that is incredibly important because we're respecting different identities, different beliefs, different cultures. And when we think about generations, very much in the same way. And I see that we have a bunch of stuff in the chat. Oh, okay, great. So the chat is working now, perfect. All right, so yeah, put your questions in the chat. Um, throughout the presentation, um, and we're here to respond to them. So as we go through this, you have to think, you know, are we doing the same thing? Are we stereotyping based on the ideas of what we have for generations? Or are we really thinking about the differences that actually exist and in more into that objective thinking on and acknowledging those differences? And then what are the similarities that exist within that? So sorry, I'm having some difficulty with the slide advancing forward. We have um, at ACU and the SAR Center, a building an inclusive organization um, toolkit. And I just wanted to put this on here because as we talk about this, and as I mentioned, you know, stereotyping tends to happen a lot. 
when we think across generations, um, you know, it's something that has existed for a long time, but diversity is essential. It is such an important component of your organization, how your organization is advancing. But when you think about this, you also wanna look at that it's not solely the goal. You also have to think about how you're making these spaces equitable and inclusive. And that does include the different generations that are currently in the workplace. And then finally, before I pass it over to Alex, um, we just wanted to put these two um, links. Uh, basically, they're actually two articles that speak very differently about generations in the workforce. The first one talks about how, you know, those differences are really limiting. And yes, there is conflict, but we have to look at it in a broader category. The second one takes a lot of that um, thinking around this of, the traditionalists have this way of doing things. Millennials have these way of doing things, Gen X, baby boomers. So we just thought it was an interesting read and resources that we could provide to you. And I just wanna look at the chat. Um, okay, great. And then um, let me stop sharing and I'll pass it over to Alex. All right, thank you, Michelle. Let me jump on here, let's see. Hopefully that was the correct thing to click. Yep, we All can right. see the slides. Terrific. Um, so yeah, like uh, like Michelle was saying, um, there are up to five generations uh, working um, in the same workplace. And uh, I just read an article very recently, um, the oldest practicing physician in the United States just turned 100 years old in July. Um, he is still uh, practicing neurology in Ohio and uh, training residents. So that's, uh, so if you wanna talk about generational difference, you have, um, as Michelle posted up there, the traditionalist generation, right? Or he might be like, whatever the generation is before that, we were just discussing um, that. And then he is teaching, if he's teaching residents, um, then they're probably the kind of youngest end of uh, what we segment out as the millennial generation. So, so you absolutely can have like huge differences, um, but you also have generations that can be fairly close together, right? A lot of millennial and Gen X um in the workplace and a lot of times in, in kind of overlapping levels of responsibility um and so we also have a lot of workplace conflict and that is a very big thing that's actually um to give you a little bit of like why am i talking about this that's uh what i did uh, my graduate studies in was conflict resolution i specifically looked at workplace conflict and uh, as anyone who's ever been in a workplace knows, that's a, a big topic um, and certainly a, a constant challenge. And so we're gonna kind of start off with this looking at uh, conflict in general. And um, yes, if you have anything in the chat or stuff that uh, you would like me to address or would like uh, Michelle to address, you know, please put it in the chat and um, we'll try to have some time for question and answers at the end. Um, and I'll try to uh, kind of hit points as we're going along if I see them come up. And, um, and I'm looking at the chat as well. If there's something I can answer um, back in the chat, I will do that. Um, okay, excellent. So I'll try to come back to that question a little bit at the um, as we go on. And uh, so we're going to look at, if I can get slides to advance, there we go. Um, so conflict uh, can come about from a lot of different things. It very often um, arises from disagreement or competition, right? So disagreement about how resources or time are being used um, or competition over those resources. And resources can be anything, right? It can be like there's one pencil sharpener and we're all waiting in line and we're all very upset because someone's taking too long because this is 1998 when I was in elementary school <laughs> and doing the pencil sharpener thing. Um, or it can be uh, more intangible resources like promotions in a workplace. Um, and then it can also be exacerbated or even just caused by bad communication, right? And usually communication is exacerbating some sort of conflict um, over resources. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. 
Um, but then our question is, to what degree is conflict a generational trait, right? Or is it age related? Like different ages are just not going to get along or, or just um, going to communicate differently, right? So how does communication fit into that, especially based on age um, or generation? And, you know, so we asked those mentee questions and it was interesting to see, like, it was, it was a good diversity of responses, which I, I really like. It's encouraging that there was a wide range rather than just everyone saying one thing. Um, and so one of the things is these generations that Michelle listed out, these are artificial divides, right? There is like no, no reason that someone born in 1982 is that drastically different from someone born in 1992 even though one is like the tail end of millennial and one is the um in kind of the middle or someone born in 1978 right who is not a millennial they're gen x but that 1982 person is a millennial so the the generational label is um challenging and uh, the idea is that different generations go through different kind of big formative events. And so that I think is kind of the reason some people like to use that. But generally what it becomes is another way to uh, stereotype people. So like Michelle said, age can be part of an identity group, right? And so, you can identify as being someone who is younger in the workplace, or you can even identify as a member of a specific generation. So for example, I fit in the millennial age category. Um, I don't like to use the generational labels um, for kind of the reasons that we're talking about today, but like that would be part of my identity and certainly part of what people outside see me as. They look at me and they can probably say like millennial. Um, and so companies end up investing a huge amount of money trying to deal with generational conflict and trying to make your organization into one that handles conflict in a more constructive way is absolutely worth time and money. Trying to combat generational conflict or generational differences specifically is probably a waste of that time and money because it would be very similar to saying, oh, people from different states in the US can't get along, or that's what is causing the conflict, right? You certainly may have people from one area who tend to have certain, you know, cultural values or beliefs or ways of, of speaking or expressing themselves that are a little bit different than someone from another region. But to really say that that is the root cause of a conflict between them is, a little bit of a misnomer, but the problem is it's very easy to apply these labels. And so, you know, like we were saying, um, those generational labels put people into a box, right? And so we really want to avoid that and look at people as individuals, because even though there can be kind of broad um, stereotypes that that may hold somewhat true to a large group, that doesn't really work well when you're working with individuals and that's what we all are in the workplace as individuals and so age really does become a matter of this justity equity diversity and inclusion right especially the diversity thing people absolutely do gain different experiences as their lives go on and someone who's led a longer life may have a greater diversity of experience than someone who is younger that doesn't necessarily mean that one is going to be more correct or is going to communicate more properly, they may have different preferences in how they communicate, but it absolutely has nothing to do with how old they are. I've met people who were, you know, older than me and very experienced and really brilliant communicators um, that I've learned a lot from. Uh, but I've also met people who were older than me and were absolutely terrible communicators and who I've had to try to teach <laughs> to communicate. Um, and absolutely for people that are younger than me, I have worked with people um who are 10 years or more younger than me and absolutely have taught me things about communication um and then if we want to get into like some of the funnier stereotypes i've definitely heard the ones of like you know young people or millennials um or now it would be gen z like 
looking at their phones and like not ever looking up. Um, but I've totally like walked down the street and watched like younger people on their phones dodge like obstacles and stuff and be able to kind of mediate that attention span. And then I have watched um, people who are older than me walk into, they, like literally walk into uh, street lamps. That doesn't apply to everyone though. It can totally be the other way around. I've seen, you know, people my age do stupid stuff because they weren't looking up from their phones. And I've seen older people who are amazing at multitasking um, and can text faster than me. So again, we have to look at this on an individual case, right? So when we're thinking about a conflict in our workplace, is it about generation or is it about context, All right? So people often ascribe things like loyalty to a company, flexibility with change, um, comfort with technology, all of these things to age categories. And like the obvious age categories to us are those generational labels uh, that Michelle talked about. So like, yes, while sometimes you have stereotypes that might have some kind of general um, prevalence, that's not going to work when you get down to the individual level. So loyalty to a company is not about like, oh, I'm, I'm 20 years old and so I just don't care about any company. Um, there are people who leave their companies and change jobs when they are in their 60s and everything. It's really about like, what is your workplace like and what are your life plans and goals? And realizing that people who are at earlier stages in their careers, which might be people who are younger, but it could also be people that have transitioned careers. So it could be people that are older, they just have to be newer in that career. They may not have the, the loyalty as in they are not going to stay with that company for a really long period of time because they're not going to be able to get much out in the long term from that company. And then also loyalty is kind of an, an ascription, it's a label, right? And so we want to avoid those value-based labels and so if someone leaves a company, they're probably not leaving just to be able to stab that company in the back. They're leaving for a reason, right? Very few people, people may quit suddenly out of revenge or being upset, right? And that's usually because of a, a conflict that's going on, but it's not that people who are, you know, 28 years old lack in moral character because they leave a company for higher pay. Um, even though, you know, and they should have stayed with that company and been paid less, right? Like that, I don't, I don't know that that's an appropriate moral label. Like that's certainly up for debate from everyone. We all have our different perceptions, but we have to be careful about how we're labeling things, right? Someone who stays with a company, um, it may not be out of true loyalty, but if they're older, they're closer to retirement. Do they want to go through the fight? I'm tired of applying to jobs. And because um, I spent the last like 12 years doing it, it seemed like every six months to a year. And it's a long drawn out process for the job applicant. And so certainly someone who has been through that before and has found a company that fits them really well and is doing good things for them, they're going to be loyal to it. But as they get closer to retirement, even if they don't like that company, they're gonna be more likely to stay. And so it's just the stage they're at in their life, right? If someone is you know 35 and two years away from being able to retire because i guess they make a ton of money and are way better at saving than me um again they're they're probably going to be less likely to leave um so we have to be careful about um these stereotypes especially when they include some sort of a moral judgment like loyalty right as opposed to it's not disloyal to leave a company that is a bad fit especially if you do it properly right um, and then, you know, perception of pay and benefits, right? Like, um, people just aren't, uh, say appreciative, like, oh, those young people aren't appreciative of what they're paid or like, you know, oh, the, the old guy at my company, you know, is just sticking around. Like he's not being paid what he's worth. Why is he doing that? Well, again, that may have more to do with where they are, um, in their stage of life or also just what they're seeing their peers end up doing. And so again, kind of thinking like, is this because of the person's age or is it because of the context that they happen to be fitting into in both their life course and the larger environment?
Um, so again, the reality is that everyone wants to work for a good organization that treats them well, where they're paid fairly, and where they get along with their team and their colleagues. People, people want to fit in. They want to have an enjoyable life, and that includes at work and outside. And so if they're not finding that, they're going to be more likely to leave their organization or engage in conflicts if they feel stuck in their organization, right? And so this is where you can also get bad leaders, which can lead to some of these reverse stereotypes like about the, you know, the, the mean baby boomer that's a terrible manager, right? Well, maybe they're upset with their company. They're not getting what they need out of life or their job or their organization, or they feel underappreciated, but they're in more of a position of power. So they may be loyal to the company, right? They're sticking around because they don't want to go somewhere else and be, you know, lower on the ladder, but they're taking that out on their employees. So looking at that larger context, and that could certainly apply to someone who's younger and has been promoted. So they're not going to leave the company because they've just gotten a bunch of promotions, but they may be a bad manager because they're unhappy. So again, looking at that larger context, how can we dig past the labels of like, oh, it's just because that person is obviously younger than me or older than me, All right? Um, so after thinking about that, do we think generational conflict is a thing? And this is something that I, I want people to think about now. And you know, you may have come into this thinking like, yeah, there's there's absolutely good reasons that like old people and young people fight or people of different generations aren't going to be able to get along real well and are, are constantly going to be a little bit um, going at each other. And you may think that now, you may think that later, like that's okay. I would disagree, but I think it's good for all of us to check in over time. And for me as well, I certainly have had, I had moments in the past and I didn't really know what the generational labels were. And I thought I was actually like, um older than millennial i didn't realize that it was gen y um and so i was like saying something about millennials and i had a friend correct me and that was that was a uh, like quite a while ago probably like 15 years ago and she like corrected me and explained it and i was like oh and that kind of got me thinking about a lot of the generational conflict um and then especially after um after studying and then dealing with a lot of organizational conflict issues um it really started to become clear to me like oh this is a an obvious difference and when we are in conflict we look for obvious differences because we want to label out groups and in groups is kind of one of the terms that's used right i want to know who my friends are and i want to know who my enemies are and it's really easy to pick physically obvious things and this leads to all kinds of these biases against people based on how they appear rather than the deeper context of what's going on. So it's not that people of different ages can't have differences that are causing them to be in conflict, but it's not inherently because of their age. Okay. So we talked about the in-group, out-group thing, um, and we want to be careful of that, not just in age, obviously, but in any kind of, um, you know, clearly, uh, usually like physically apparent aspect. Um, but what do we do about this? If generation isn't really the main issue, how do we address that? Especially if we have a workplace that's already divided up, you might have you know really clear tensions between staff that have been there longer and newer staff. And it might be staff that are older in age and younger in age. And if those divides, if those in-group out-groups have already been created, what do we do about that? So we want to look at communication, transparency, respect, understanding, and then try to achieve some sort of learning and growth. And all of this sounds very um, ephemeral, like kind of hard to pin down, but we're going to actually talk about some really concrete ways to do that. And the good news is that we can build workplaces that are more resilient to conflict and use healthy disagreement, healthy conflict, and make it more constructive and not destructive. One of the biggest things that always gets brought up is communication, but very often it's just like, communicate better. Well, how do we make communication that's clear, concise, polite and respectful, appropriate in form and format, um, and notes and respects other people's preferences? 
right? Because it's not just that, oh, younger people like to text message and older people like to make phone calls. And that's the solution, right? That's not it. Good communication is good communication regardless of age. Everyone wants to be communicated with clearly and well, especially in the workplace. And clarity takes practice. It, it really is a skill that you have to practice. Um, so is being concise, right? And those two go hand in hand. Um, polite and respectful. I, hopefully we all kind of have some idea of that, right? Adding a little bit more of that structure. Say you're sending an email, just something like, hey, I hope your day's going well. Like it, it takes a few seconds to type and it sounds a little bit trite, but it really does. People are like, oh, they took that time to think that through and do that. So it, it really can help things like that, you know, answering the phone and saying, hey, how's it going rather than what, right? Um, we all kind of can get a feel for those things, but we have to practice them to actually do them. Um, when we're talking about, say, phone versus email versus text, that appropriate form and format of communication is important. And again, regardless of generation, like, yeah, I, I like to receive texts rather than phone calls, but if it's something where I need a lot of detail spelled out, and it might have to be kind of a careful, really context heavy conversation, I want a phone call. Like, it doesn't matter that I might be more comfortable like texting, you know, that's, that's something that requires a phone call. If it's really complex instructions, rather than even a phone call or a text, I'd probably prefer an email, right? Where someone can bullet point things out, highlight important things for me, because I'm kind of like, you know, like, I gotta, I gotta go back and recheck things. I, I can't hold stuff up here very long. So I need that like checklist, right? So thinking like, how do I communicate most effectively um, for the situation and for the person? If I know the person and know their preferences, and especially if you have some way in your workplace to signal those preferences. Um, one way that people don't think of, but you can really do this is with like your phone voicemail, where someone can say like, so I couldn't pick up the phone right now, you know, send me a text message if this is urgent. They're saying, oh, if this falls into a certain category of communication, use this alternative method. Or even on emails in your signature, you could say how you prefer to be communicated with. Say, apologies, emails may have a slow response, but you can call if this requires a more immediate response, right? So we can start to kind of normalize these ways of saying, how do we prefer to communicate? And within your organization, you can also just in onboarding processes and stuff, make it clear to people like, hey, here's how we structure communication. We use to say like at the Star Center, we use Slack, which is the messaging program. And that's how we do a lot of more informal communication because you need that rapid back and forth sometimes. And it's not always expressed, but very often the idea is like, oh, that's something where someone's probably gonna respond a little bit faster. Whereas email, like it wouldn't be, you know, upsetting if someone didn't respond for several hours because that's kind of the idea with email is it's like a little bit more compressed time frame than like snail mail I guess <laughs> but email the more formal structure means like you can take longer to respond but if something really necessary very immediate response we're going to use that messaging app or we're going to do phone calls and if you're working in person then it's great you kind of probably have that informal culture of oh there's some people I'm just going to go to their office and knock on their door and we might talk right um yes and uh michelle uh mentions that we do enjoy sending some pet photos over slack um obviously i guess that would depend on uh what your pet is if it's like a naked mole rat they're kind of weird you might want to ask people beforehand but i think in general pet photos are also better texted than over a phone call it's hard to just describe like you know oh my pet's doing something adorable right now you should see Right, so choosing the appropriate form of communication uh, for the moment. And then another thing with communication tips that I think are uh, less frequently addressed, like a little less basic, we're gonna go up to the uh, higher, higher level here, is recognizing stress-induced changes in learning. That sounds really complex, but it's actually pretty easy. If something's really stressful, right afterwards while you're still amped up your body's not ready to deal with critique and i say your body because this is a very complex physiological process but your brain basically is not going to form really clear distinct memories where you can then go back and analyze and be like okay i need to i 
you know, was told to do this better and so I'm gonna do it better in this way. You're not ready for that yet. So you want to tie some sort of positive outcome to a high stress event afterwards, right? And so that is something like, you know, it, it's the great thing, like you've just done some big project as a team and you get to celebrate the win, right? And so recognizing when we're communicating with people, times to give critique, which is a little bit more removed from the stressor and times to reinforce good actions or behaviors, right? And so even if things didn't go well, immediately following a stressful event, let's communicate successes, wins, things we wanna perpetuate, things we wanna continue doing. Hey, your communication was really good. I appreciated that daily update email. Like, let's make sure the next time we have a big project, we're doing that, that was great. Awesome, that's appropriate post-stressor communication. And then that longer duration after stressor, then it can be like, okay, let's all come together and let's also ask for feedback, right? I, we do a lot of editing of documents that we publish at ACU. And it's just kind of natural to say like, okay, I've written this thing. I worked really hard on it. This is how I type. Um, I worked really hard on it. Let me send it to Michelle and ask for edits. Well, Michelle will just turn that paper into a red, like, you know, mass of comments and like fixes and be like, where'd you learn English? And I'm like, I don't know. I picked it up. But um, but that's good. That's okay. And I'm like, all right, great feedback. I'm going to fix all these things. I'm going to learn the difference between which and that. Um, and we're going to get this all sorted out and it's better. I asked for that feedback. It makes it easier to receive, right? And so if we can get in the habit of asking for feedback and having other people ask for feedback, invite it. Um, that makes it a lot easier to, uh, to receive. And so especially if you're in a management position, modeling that and then telling people why, right? We talked about transparency, like that's a big thing. Sometimes people just want to know why they're doing something. And so saying like, hey, we're all going to be able to kind of work on becoming better at our jobs if we ask for this feedback. And so that's why I'm having you do it this way. And so kind of explaining that process to people. Um, avoiding blindly ascribing intent. That's another thing that goes with stress is we tend to start um, thinking that people have done things with purpose when it may just be the way something worked out or that purpose that we're ascribing may not have been on their mind at all. And this is where you get a lot of, I think, uh, exaggeration of uh, say like office politics is what it's often called, where someone's like, oh, that person, that person's trying to make me look bad in front of the boss or whatever. And it's like, well, no, they just saw a problem and they went and solved it. They didn't mean to like overstep you. They just saw that it needed fixing right away and it was an easy solution. So they sent that email or whatever it is. And like, I'm not saying that certainly there are people who get into real like tips and will try to undermine each other. I'm not trying to minimize when that happens. That's a, that's a big deal and, and needs to be dealt with really appropriately. But we need to be careful of ascribing that that intentionally negative behavior to people um, or even things as small as reading in uh, context and tone to written messages, right? I'm sure we've all been there when we read a message and we're like, oh, this person sounds really upset. And then we go and talk to them and they're not. It just came across that way in text. So we gotta be careful of that. And stress makes it much more prone to that. So when we're stressed out, we need to recognize that we're more likely to make assumptions about people's intent that are not necessarily correct. And so we just need to, just like any other bias, just work on being conscious of it and work to combat it. Um, and then we talked a little bit about feedback and seeking critique. So a couple of methods I like to use if you have to give feedback is called SBI, that's situation behavior impact. And so you say like, what was the situation? Hey, the other day, um, I uh, you know sent that uh, or put that PowerPoint on the drive, and you know two hours later you sent me back like tons of edits, um, and that made me feel like pretty down on how I'd done on the PowerPoint. I felt like I hadn't big, done a good job. I wasn't ready for feedback at that point, right? So situation, I you know put this PowerPoint somewhere. Behavior. What did the person do? And you're not, you're just describing what it was. You're not saying what they intended or anything. Like you, you know, made a bunch of edits to it and, and a bunch of comments saying stuff needed to be corrected. 
the impact? What did that do to me? Like, how did it make me feel? Um, and then that's a good way to open up like, okay, how can we do that better next time? Well, maybe I won't put it on the public drive until I'm ready for comments or I'll send you a message when I'm ready to have it critiqued. Um, and then same thing, seeking critique, sustain and improve, right? Sustain, you did this well, let's keep doing it. Improve, how can we make this better? And then add or remove, right? Add is we should try doing this next time. Remove, we should not do this next time. So those are kind of ways to work on that communication and have like a really set pattern to it. So I like giving people really concrete things they can do. Hopefully those are helpful. A couple other tips. Team building is a continuous process, right? It's not just a one-off thing. Um, try to increase interaction between departments and groups, right? It's really easy to be like, all baby boomers are, you know, super obnoxious and power hungry. Well, if the only person in your department that's a baby boomer is one person, and that's that individual's issue, right? That um, that kind of stereotyping and labeling doesn't happen as much or gets diluted down, at least when you're interacting with other people um, of that similar identity group who are individuals and provide a different perspective, right? And you realize, oh, people are just different. Um, and so more interaction between different groups really helps. Um, and it can help reduce conflict between departments if they're having to interact together, right? Team building can be a common project. It doesn't have to be some random independent thing you go and make people do on a Saturday afternoon um, where they do like a ropes course or something. I think it'd be a project where they like feel a sense of accomplishment that they did for the workplace during work. Um, and then we talked about building that common language. One of the things being how do we prefer to communicate different types of information, right? And then obviously respect for different opinions and values. Um, good leaders and fostering good leaders. Again, a lot of these tips are things that leaders should be modeling and should be actively teaching to their people. So I saw there was a question earlier on. I wanna make sure I address that of um, about leadership. Let's see. Yeah, could I address how a supervisor can talk to staff about going the extra mile an exempt employee working overtime sometimes to get the job done, dealing with attention to some workers only wanting to do the minimum, which is inconsistent with our workplace culture. Um, so that's kind of a, a challenge. It's if anyone's seen the movie Office Space, where uh, Jennifer Anderson's character has to wear a certain number of, um, she works at like a Ruby Tuesdays kind of place, and they have to have little pins on their uniform, their pieces of flair. And uh, the manager comes up, yep, someone put in the chat flare. Um, so the pieces of flare and, and the manager's like, you're only wearing 13 pieces of flare. And she's like, that's the minimum required. And he's like, but I want you to wear more pieces of flare. And she's like, well, why don't you just make that the minimum number? Like, and he's like, but I want you to just wear more. And so there is certainly a value that some people have of going far above and beyond what a described job is. But we have to recognize that's not a universal value. And just because you see that as good, that doesn't mean that it's good for that other person, right? They may have other things going on. If you want them to do more, it should be in the job description. They should know that ahead of time. And you can talk to them and say, like, this is what we do to compensate people for that extra input. This is why that extra input's important. But that's only a conversation that you can have if you're willing to be flexible and recognize where they're coming from. So you can use that SBI to initiate that conversation, but you're gonna have to probably be ready to invite some feedback about like, what does it feel like when I tell you that we feel like you should be doing more? And it's probably gonna be something along the lines of, I do a lot and you don't recognize or respect that. And I'm not saying like targeted this person, but like just be ready for that kind of feedback and for it to be that blunt um, depends on the person, but that can be really challenging. Yeah, Michelle. Alex, do you mind if I add something to yeah, yeah. that? Because I put in the chat about quiet quitting. So I think we've heard a lot about this. 
in the news and oftentimes it is when you read the articles that you know it's the younger generations that are doing this but that is very much not the case i think part of it too as we went through covid the pandemic everything that's going on a lot of people have reevaluated their values where the work life balance is much more important or they see working you know way beyond what they've been asked to do as something that may be exploitative. So one of the things that I would always say with this, because this is a very tough thing and it requires a cultural change, which the organization may not be ready to do. So having that open communication with the staff, incredibly important to ensure that you have that, but also can you meet somewhere in the middle? So talking to them about, we do need you, you know, we have these deadlines, it just has to get done. But can you do, for example, informal comp time another, you know, a few other days if there was, you know, they work like 12, 13, 14 hours or more, um, or even past that eight hour time frame. So I think that's the biggest part of if you're able to have that um, communication that goes both ways, people can better understand why you're coming at this from that, um, rather than them feeling, well, they're just kind of saying, I only do the minimum and you know what, why am I going to make that that extra effort? But also agreeing with Alex, it's important to write that down as part of a job description so people know, you know, even saying something like, you know, ensuring that deadlines are met on time, those type of things. Yeah. And and I would say if we do want to talk about differences in generation or at least kind of age range, um, one thing too is recognizing that some of us may come from positions where our pay is better for the amount of work that we do than people who are in generally newer positions. Um, and I don't just mean that as like certainly in the past, um, so I think it was about 40 years ago in the 1970s, I guess it'd be 50 years ago now, um, the average wage um, updated for inflation was somewhere in the like, I'm trying to remember, $23, $24 an hour range. And now it's in the $20 to $21 an hour. So that average pay adjusted for inflation has gone down. And so when we think about people at the bottom end of that, especially at our health centers, our MAs and stuff, like the medical assistant, I've been there. It's uh, generally the position where it's like, you know, you need to clean up the human juice or like you have to go um, do the do the grunt work. And they're making, even if we're paying more than the minimum wage, the minimum wage is not, not appropriate compensation to then tell someone, hey, why aren't you going above and beyond? And so that's one of the things we have to keep in mind where even if we don't feel like, yes, I would love to make twice my salary. Michelle, but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I make a, a fortunately like very comfortable wage, I can survive. And like my partner and I can afford our apartment and can afford to put some money away to retirement. Um, there are other people and if they're, you know, kind of living truly paycheck to paycheck, like asking people to go above and beyond can be really challenging. And so it's not just people who have been in the workplace long enough that even though their wages also haven't necessarily kept up, they're still so far above that uh, medium um, that they're that we're doing okay. It's also those of us who manage to, because of education and other things, um, jump ahead and we're far enough above that median that we don't necessarily feel it. But being down around the new kind of consensus minimum wage, which is fifteen dollars an hour, that's that's very low wages and it can be really challenging to motivate people um, at those wages. And I think someone said like you, you give accolades even when you can't give pay raises and stuff. And, and that's really good. Like absolutely recognize work and remind people of like, hey, we get to do this cool thing today. So that then later when they are working on that boring thing, it's like, we're just gonna get through this together. Um, but don't expect people to necessarily be like super cheery about doing a job that they don't like or aspects of a job that they don't like. Um, but that's one of the things where we can try to to be very transparent. And like Michelle said, with the quiet quitting, one of the things that really helps with that is letting people know you're invested in their success. If their success lies elsewhere, and this is hard to do, we are not taught this from the organizational management side. Being invested in someone's success means if you need to go off and seek your fortune elsewhere, 
we're going to do everything we can to help you until you leave, right? In exchange, we just want to know when you're going to leave, right? So if I have a medical assistant and they say, I want to go to nursing school, and you don't have the ability to talk to them and say, hey, we do like some tuition exchange and say so you could keep working here and, you know, pay for nursing school classes and we'll flex your hours. If you can't do that to try to keep them, um, then you may have to say, that's awesome. Like work here. We have some overtime that can be done if you're trying to save up a little extra money. Like whenever you're ready, we'll write you a recommendation letter. Like you can talk to some of the other nurses and stuff and you know, like, just let them know you're invested in their future, even if that future is somewhere else, because they're more likely to tell you, hey, I'm going to leave. Um, it's it's really important. Uh, and I had a, a boss at one point that I didn't really get along with. Um, like, I worked well for him, but I, it was a fight to tell him ahead of time that I was going to leave. You know, and I, I gave him like over a month's notice and everything when I did leave that position. Um, but that was a little bit of a fight for me because I was like, eh, we kind of know we don't get along and he's not going to be real thrilled when I leave. Um, so like, do I want to tell him? And so, you know, generally quiet quitting is not a symptom of like, oh, that person's crappy because they just left without telling us. It means communication was bad. Right, and we have to really be ready to invite some feedback um, on behalf of our organizations, or if we're in that position on behalf of ourselves, and say like, why this person leave? Even if they tell us the day, like I'm quitting today. Okay, do you mind telling me why you didn't tell me, you know, ahead of time? Um, and so there, there's no no time that's too late to start that transparency. Just say I'm sorry you feel that way. Do you mind just telling me a little bit, like really honestly? Um, about what made you do that. And then at least we can try to improve that with the rest of our staff. But that's a big challenge. So like Alex, I, said, I think Clarissa yeah. may have a question oh, as yeah. well. Um, let's see, it looks like Mariah. Um, yeah, they had their hand raised. Okay. Oh, there she is, I think. We allow her to unmute. And just real quick while that's going on, um, here are some other resources. So the Star Center has lots of really good resources. These three are webinars. I get one's a webinar series, um, just kind of about organizational um, kind of team building and managing stress and burnout, which contributes to a lot of this conflict in general. Um, and then here are some resources from outside organizations. Um, the Center for Creative Leadership uh, has fantastic resources. Um, they also do some really like high-end trainings, but they have a lot of free resources as well. And so I'd recommend uh, checking out some of those. Um, and then obviously the PowerPoints are going to get sent out to everyone. So all these links will work on the PDF of the PowerPoint that gets shared. Okay, and let's see, Clarissa should be able to unmute now. Oh, Clarissa oh, said okay. it was a mistake. <laughs> oh, no. That's okay. She yep. said she was enjoying the webinar, so that's... There you go. <laughs> um, but yes, if anyone else has questions, I know we are at time, um, but uh, I'm happy to uh, to answer any questions anyone has for a few more minutes. I hope this was helpful. Um, I hope everyone, including me, I keep doing it, um, trying to challenge uh, my conceptualization of what causes conflict versus what's just a stereotype. Oh, Cynthia and says, just to clarify, is conflict rooted in generational differences? Um, so no it can be exacerbated by it but there is nothing that says like an 80 year old is naturally going to argue with a 20 year old right um so be careful of of that you know urge to just say like oh it's because of age like let's talk to this person as an individual um and really try to get down to the roots of it and i'd say if you can use that sbi uh the situation behavior impact um, to start off the discussion and just be ready to have a really honest discussion. I hope that helps. And best of luck. Conflict is never easy to deal with, um, but I think uh, you'll be able to to manage quite well. You all seem yeah. very attentive, like a great audience. And Cynthia, with that, um, as you know, as Alex was saying, it you know, there's so many things that go into it. Lack of respect, absolutely. With 
conflict, um, but also just differences. You know, people have differences and it's not necessarily based on their generation, but different lived experiences, different ways of communicating. So um, I just wanted to say that. And please um, fill out the evaluation. There's a poll if um, before you leave today. And for Raquel, yes, the uh, recording will also be available. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the slides. Mm -hmm. And links to those, I think, will be sent out following the webinar. Mm -hmm.